Folks, you're listening to the Drew Marshall Show. It's our St. Patrick's Day special. And speaking of Irish, nothing says Irish like the last name Airman. <laughs> Bart Airman. He's actually quite a fun guest. We've had him on the show a couple of times. And uh, he's the author of a new book called Jesus Before the Gospels, How the Earliest Christians Remembered, Changed, and Invented Their Stories of the Savior. Many believe that the gospel stories of Jesus are based on eyewitness testimony and are therefore historically reliable. Now, for the first time, a scholar of the New Testament, New York Times bestselling author Bart D. Ehrman, uh, author of uh, Misquoting Jesus and Jesus Interrupted, surveys research from the fields of psychology, anthropology, and sociology to explore how oral traditions and group memories really work and questions how reliable the Gospels can be. Focusing on the decades-long gap between when Jesus lived and when these documents about him began to appear, Ehrman looks to these varied disciplines to see what they can tell us about how the New Testament developed in the book. Joining us all the way from... Actually, I don't even know where he's from. Bart, where are you from? <laughs> I'm from uh, North Carolina. <laughs> there he is. Welcome back. It's good to have you again, sir. Thanks. Nice to be here. Is your address public? Because I'm sure there's a lot of Jesus people that would be driving by throwing eggs at your house. <laughs> Yeah, my my address is not public. Uh, no, so uh, but they can they can throw eggs at my school. <laughs> okay, and uh, what's the name of the school again, sir? It's the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill, North Carolina. That's James Taylor country. That's yes, what, it is. Yeah, James Taylor. It's on way. the way to Florida too. Is it? Do you drive through that, John? Uh, well, ne- and two weeks. John McCauley is our uh, Belfast boy co-host today here on the show. John McCauley, this is Bart Ehrman. Hi, Bart. Hey, how you doing? Very good, thank you. So, how much heat have you taken for this one? Is this the biggest the biggest heat you've taken for any of your books? No, no, no. I get heat for all my books. <laughs> so, this one just came out, so uh, so there hasn't been that much heat generated yet. But uh, it is it does deal with some controversial things. Yeah, you think? Yeah. <laughs> so immediately, you know, people hear the setup for this book and they think. Well, he's just he's just putting holes in the Gospels here, man. He's saying that it's not truth. It's not truth. There's no such thing as truth anymore. How do you handle that pushback? Uh, well, you know, I don't deal with the bigger issue of what truth is. <laughs> that, that might take a book or two. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what I do in this book is talk about what was happening to the stories of Jesus that were being told by word of mouth year after year after year after year uh, before the Gospel writers got a hold of these stories. And I argue that what we know about memory can uh, radically affect how we understand these stories being in circulation for all those decades. Does it matter what you believe when it comes to us reading your books? Should we care where you come from? Because I kind of think we should. So I, I kind of want to get into the whole, well, what do you actually believe before we get into your book? Yeah. Because because there are those who are going to, you know, read your book and they're going to say, well, where is it? what's this guy? Where is he coming from, man? So what do you yeah, believe? Yeah. Well, so uh, let me just say that, you know, I'm not writing the book for a particular religious point of view. Uh, the The only point of view that's really would really be attacked by the book would be fundamentalism. Uh, so if somebody doesn't have a kind of a strict literalistic interpretation of the Bible where everything has to be completely accurate, then they're not going to be threatened by the book because I mean, the book does talk about inaccurate stories in the, in the New Testament, memories that are distorted memories about the life of Jesus. But uh, unless you think that the Bible can't have any mistakes in it of any kind, then that shouldn't be threatening. So the vast majority of... I, I, well, certainly all evangelicals would believe that the uh, the Bible is infallible and there are no mistakes in it. And right, I mean, that's it. John. Are you are you feeling okay? Well, just about you that? need to be careful between infallibility and inerrancy. There, there's room within the evangelical world to hold infallibility, not necessarily inerrancy. Bart, would that be right? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, there you know, certainly very conservative evangelicals would think that there can't be any mistakes of any kind in the Bible, but there are other other evangelicals who would say that what what is infallible is what the Bible is trying to affirm. That that if it's trying to teach a particular uh, doctrine, for example, or a certain uh, a way of living, that 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 would be an infallible instruction. But but the details could be wrong. Okay, so. Jesus being remembered and misremembered. How do you think Jesus has been misremembered? Well, in lots of ways. And so, uh, I mean, today he's misremembered all over the map. So, I mean, for example, people today who hold to the prosperity gospel, who think that that, uh, what Jesus' teaching was all about is teaching us how 
by following his instruction, we can become uh, personally wealthy. Uh, they obviously have a different view of things from those who understand that Jesus taught that you should sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. I mean, either Jesus was in favor of wealth or he's in favor of, of poverty. He can't be in favor of both. And so uh, somebody's misremembering. And my point is, is that the misremembering that happens today is, uh, was almost certainly happening in the early decades after his death. Everybody didn't remember him the same way, and sometimes the way they remembered him were at odds with each other. And so there, there are some uh, distorted memories already in the Gospels. Okay, are you saying that in the Bible there is inaccuracy? Some of the things that were recorded in the Bible were recorded in such a way because uh, people didn't remember correctly, so therefore they wrote down incorrectly. That's right. That's exactly what I'm saying, and I try to demonstrate that. Uh, and so uh, that, that's not a new point. I mean, people have argued that for many, many years. Sure. My, my, the point I raise in this book is that if you understand how memory works, then that, that point makes a lot of sense. Uh, because, you know, look, the reality is we not only forget things all the time, we also misremember things all the time. Right. And psychologists have shown that we actually invent memories in our head. Things that we're sure we remember, in fact, are invented. Mm. And so the question is, when you're dealing with ancient people who also had uh, problems of memory, how, how did that affect the way they told their stories, especially when you've got stories of Jesus that somebody hears a story that was heard from someone else that was heard from someone else that was heard from someone else for 40 years what are the likely what's yeah. the likelihood that that story is going to never change except uh, the pushback that i've heard in the in the uh, tribe for 30 plus years is sure if if it was just humans involved in this whole process yeah you can totally understand it but if there is a god if there is a creator and if this god is supernaturally powerful and involved and maybe he's able to set things up and to help people remember and to help the recording of things down and so if god's really behind this he's going to make it so that it doesn't get all screwed up your pushback yeah, on that well, that's that's right you you could say that there was a miracle to prevent the tr stories from changing yeah so then in order to test that hypothesis all you need to do is to look at the stories to see if they were changed and the reality is we have the same story told in different gospels sometimes in radically different ways sometimes in ways that are contradictory to one another and so the stories were changing and that that seems to to show that in fact there wasn't some kind of supernatural miracle to make sure that stories were never altered bart you know would you say then that when the canon of scripture is put together do you think the the, the gatherers of that canon and the debates that went on, they were aware that there were some textual problems probably even back then, correct? Uh, well, some of them were, and some of them celebrated the differences. I mean, the Church Father Origen, for example, in the third century, uh, said that there are all sorts of contradictions in the Bible, and that God put the contradictions there so that you would understand that you can't interpret the Bible literally, because if you interpret it literally, it's a contradiction. And so he argued you have to interpret it figuratively. So uh, there certainly were people who did see that there were problems. So then the, the natural question is, in your book and what you've written, first of all, if someone reads it for a first time without any background of textual criticism, they are going to go into panic mode. They're going to end up in their pastor's office. And as you know, most pastors, I'm a minister myself, would get very quickly overwhelmed. But what can you offer that the scriptures, even though you hold out these numerous variants, what can the scriptures help serve in bringing a person to an, an understanding of a God who's clearly revealing himself? Uh, well, I don't, I don't deal with that issue because I'm not a theologian. Um, that would be a question that a, a pastor or a theological teacher would probably want to deal with. But I'm approaching this purely from a historical point of view. I'm asking the, the simple historical question, uh, how were these stories changed, and how were some of the stories invented, and, and how would we know? Uh, okay, what's an example of an invented story? An invented story? Um, in the Gospels, when Jesus is put on trial before Pontius Pilate, if you, if you line up the Gospels chronologically, so the first Gospel is Mark, and then Matthew, then Luke, and the last Gospel is John, you'll find, by studying what, uh, what is said about uh, Jesus' trial before Pontius Pilate, that over time, Pilate becomes increasingly innocent. Uh, in, in Mark's Gospel, he condemns Jesus to death. In Matthew's Gospel, and only in Matthew, we're told that he washes his hands and says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. 
When you get to Luke's Gospel later, Pilate declares Jesus innocent three times. Uh, when you get to the Gospel of John, Pilate not only declares him innocent three times, he hands him over to the Jewish chief priest to be crucified. And so you wonder, well, what's going on with this increasing exoneration of Pilate so that he's no longer guilty? Why are Christians saying this about Pilate? And it's pretty clear why they were saying that. It's because if Pilate's innocent in the death of Jesus, who's guilty? It's those Jews. Uh, and so the Christians who are telling these stories are blaming Jews for the killing of Jesus, which eventually, of course, leads to the claim that, get, that Jews were Christ killers. Uh, well, that's affecting how they're remembering the event, even though the way they're remembering this is certainly not right. So, so then the natural question would be, from a historian's side then, what is the actual facts then? Have you been able to come to your own conclusion of what actually took place in those events? Well, we don't know, we don't know the precise details, but almost certainly what happened is that Jesus was put on trial for calling himself King of the Jews. Pilate thought he was a troublemaker, and so he ordered him crucified. So the idea that the Jewish crowds are crying out for blood, or that they're saying things like, his blood be upon us and our children, as you find in Matthew 27, those things are later, uh, those are twists on what actually happened, and they represent distorted memories of the event. So, so the natural question <laughs> then to that is, are the scriptures adequate to bring us to an understanding of who Jesus claims himself to be? Good question. Um, I think Jesus claims himself to be different things in different Gospels, so that the claims of Jesus in the Gospel of John, where he claims to be a divine being, where he says things like, I and the Father are one, or before Abraham was, I am, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. These claims you don't find in the earlier Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, for that reason, scholars have long argued that this portrayal of Jesus calling himself divine is, is distinctive of the Gospel of John, and it's not a historical memory at all. It's a the theologizing of history. It's, it's taking history and imposing a theology on it. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, I'm fairly limited in my understanding on that side. But the you're, early, you're just limited in I'm your limited. understanding. I'm limited. I'm from Northern Ireland. I'm limited. <laughs> but, Bart, it is fair to say, and I think important for our listeners to understand, that evangelical scholars would actually concur there is a problem with that particular text, but the rest of the text around uh, broader clearly lead us towards uh, a claim of divinity. Um, I would say that all of the Gospel writers do understand that Jesus is divine. I would agree with that, but I think that they mean different things by it. I don't think that Mark has John's understanding of what it even means for Jesus to be a divine being. And so I don't think that there's one clear message of the Bible when it comes to that or almost any other issue. Hmm. So in this book, you talk about memory studies, and then, of course, there's, uh, there's anthropological studies, and, and then there's oral traditions, and all these three things kind of stirred in a pot. Look, we realize, we, we know ourselves enough to know that, especially as you approach 50, John, you see. 52. 52. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, I'm pulling out pronouns for me these days, uh, remembering people's names, uh, it's like passing a kidney stone. It's so hard for me yeah. these days. And then there's the oral tradition. Well, I heard this story, and I heard that, you know. For example, I had Gandhi's grandson on a few weeks ago, and, I, and we, we said to him, what was that big line that, you know, uh, that's quoted about Gandhi? I would have become a Christian had it not been for the Christians. And I asked Gandhi's grandson if that's the way it went down, and no, that's not actually the way it went down. It was something different. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I had one time I had uh, the granddaughter of Yogi Berra in my uh, New Testament class. <laughs> And uh, she told me that all those one-liners from Yogi Berra, in fact, are made up, too. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Really? Yeah. Wow. Deja vu all over again. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Exactly. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so it's a no-brainer, literally, to, to think, oh, you know, we, we misremember things, we mistell things. And, and you've gone into this book and explained to us uh, the, the research behind it. And, and uh, you know, there's lots of uh, really interesting stuff about that. But that's, I get that. Okay, you don't have to convince me that we're morons. Okay, I get it. We've been morons since, since day one. But, again, I, you kind of come back to, well, if there is a God, and by the way, do you think there's a God, Bart? No. Okay. So, if there is a God, then this God would would intercede somehow and and make the scriptures holy. No, I don't know I don't know that that's true. 
I mean, if there is a God, that doesn't mean necessarily that he's going to provide holy scriptures. That's an assumption that some, that a lot of Christians have, but I mean, there's no no necessity in it. There's no reason that if there's a God that, that he has to make scriptures holy. Right. But the early church fathers clearly held to the line that there was something sacred about these, and they could bring us to a greater revelation of who God is and his intentions for mankind. Yeah, no, that's right. That's, that is what the Church Fathers would have said, but that doesn't mean that it's a, a logical necessity. I'm not even sure, Bart, where you stand on Jesus. Uh, d- was he real? Uh, I, yes, yes. I, I wrote another book called Did Jesus Exist, where I argue that Jesus certainly existed as a historical figure, and I think we can say a lot of things about him. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a Christian, and so I I uh, don't think that Jesus was raised from the dead. I, d- I don't believe in the divinity of Christ. Uh, I think that he was a Jewish preacher from rural Palestine, and that he was uh, predicting uh, that God was soon going to intervene in history to overthrow the forces of evil and bring in a good kingdom on earth, and that this is all going to happen during his disciples' lifetime. We are on the phone with Bart Ehrman, and he, of course, is the author of Jesus Before the Gospels. That's what we're chatting about right now. Our engineer, Tim the Tool, is uh, giving me some kind of weird hand signals over no, I here. Just, I think, you know, ultimately, you know, it calls into question any, any historical documents ever. You know, um, you know, word of mouth, you know, sure. especially tradition. the ancient the ancient texts, you yep. know, like they weren't written down right away. So there's that part. But I've also heard it maybe once again, this is, you know, the, from the Christian side, the fundamental side that, you know, because people didn't write our muscle slash brain remembered things efficiently, yeah. differently, so better I, than they do now because we don't we're not use them that often. Yeah, so... Yeah, you know, I, I deal with that in a full chapter where I show that anthropologists have demonstrated that that's not true. That uh, That's what I always heard, too. Uh, but, in fact, we know from studies of oral cultures that they don't have better memories, and they, in fact, don't try to preserve their traditions accurately the way we think they should, those of us who are used to written traditions where we can compare writings to see whether they're the same or not. Okay, um, so the takeaway that you would like people... In other words, if this book gets into evangelical Christians' hands, first of all, it's going to burn on the skin, I think, a little bit. Uh -uh. It might might hurt. Uh, But uh, what do you... I mean, are you trying to rattle people's faith? Is that... You know, no, you want... no, 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 that's not the, that's not the point at all. The right. point is to try to understand what these Gospels really are. What people don't realize often is that if Jesus died in the year 30, which is commonly thought, and the first Gospel was Mark, which is usually dated by critical scholars around the year 70, and John is the last Gospel usually dated around 90 to 95, it means there's a 40 to 65 year gap between the time Jesus lived uh, and the, the first accounts of his life. Uh, so my question is, what's going on during those 40 to 65 years as people are telling and retelling their stories year after year after year before anybody writes them down? And my, my thesis in the book is that the stories get changed because of what typically happens in oral cultures when, when traditions are passed on by word of mouth. This is a really unfair and, and quite, quite possibly an immature question. I'm pretty good at those. If you were a Christian, do you think there would be room for you to come to the same conclusions that you've come to in this book? Uh, yeah, the views I sketch in this book were actually the views I had when I was a Christian hmm. about the oral traditions changing, hmm. and there being uh, gospel stories that are that are not historically accurate, and some of them, uh, in fact, didn't happen at all. I, I thought that when I was still a Christian. So, Bart, Bart, I mean, you went to Moody, you went to Wheaton. I mean, you, you grew up through the, the bastions of fundamentalism and evangelicalism. But, but yet, you know, and I offer this as kindly as I can, one of the criticisms are that you've moved away from the fundamentalism on one side and gone to a liberal fundamentalism on the other. How, how do you respond to those critics? Yeah, I think it's absolutely wrong, because for for uh, probably 15, 18 years, I was a completely liberal Christian, uh, without any fundamentalism in my blood at all. I, I still uh, went to church, uh, I still said the creed, but I didn't believe that the Bible was the infallible Word of God in any sense. Uh, and so uh, I'm not... 
I'm not adopting a fundamentalism at all. What I'm doing is opposing fundamentalism. I'm saying that if, if your view of the Bible is that it can't have mistakes in it, that that can't hold up to under scrutiny. And that if you're going to be a, if you're going to be a Christian or if you're going to be an agnostic or whatever you're going to be, you should use your intelligence. And that it's better to have an informed faith than an ignorant faith. And so we shouldn't pretend that there are no problems hmm. when, in fact, there are problems when it comes to something like the Bible. So, so during all that time, was there any time where you could say that there was some sort of divine encounter you had, or has it always been a logic-based journey for you? Because it's... Oh, no, no, it, w- it wasn't a logic-based journey for me at all. It was very much an experiential thing. I mean, I, I had a born-again experience in high school that had nothing to do with logic. <laughs> so where do, where do you frame that, those experiences now? What, what do I? I'm sorry. Say it again. So how, he, uh, sorry, he has an accent, and I, I just want to apologize on behalf of South Carolina. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, meaning, how do you frame those experiences now in light of the fact that you don't believe in God, you don't believe Jesus claimed to be yeah. God? I think, I mean, people have religious experiences in all sorts of religions, uh, of course. I mean, every, every, every participant in every religion, whether they're in Islam or Judaism or Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism or name your religion, people have religious experiences, but I think most evangelical Christians wouldn't think that these other religions are genuine religious experiences, they're something else. My view is that they're, they, they can all be explained by, by typical psychological processes. Okay. I mean, where I was in my life at the time was there, there were things that religion was, became very important to me, and especially, you know, a relation, uh, relationship with Christ. Uh, made a lot of sense for me at that time, both emotionally and psychologically. I love having you on the show because you just give me a stinking headache. Is what that's the first reason I love, but <laughs> but no, because it it puts you know I can sit back with my doubts and whinge about them, but you put meat on my doubts, and other people would would lean in or listen into that part of what I'm talking about and go, oh well, you don't want more meat on your doubt, Drew. No, I do. I want to process <laughs> doubt. I do. I want to yeah. process my doubt. Uh, Bart Ehrman examines in this book a few things, how cultural anthropologists studied the oral traditions of Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Ghana to reveal how stories always change as they are passed along. He examines how uh, psychologists have discovered the routine phenomena of false memories and how strongly people contend that these false memories really happened. He also examines how modern legal scholars and psychologists have shown how unreliable eyewitness testimonies really are with people regularly distorting what they've experienced. And, of course, he also examines how sociologists have uh, shown that a group's collective memory is strongly shaped by the issues and concerns of the remembering community just as much by the events themselves. Jesus Before the Gospels is a compelling narrative that not only demonstrates uh, Bart Ehrman's deep knowledge and meticulous scholarship, but also challenges the historical accuracy of the Gospels and what they tell us about the historical Jesus, the way we read and think about these sacred texts and how we view history. The website is Bart D. Ehrman, and his last name is spelled E-H-R-M-A-N, E-H-R-M-A-N, Bart D. Ehrman, uh, dot com. Bart, do you have many... Um, uh, Christian radio shows have you as a guest? Does that happen? Uh, yeah, it does happen. And um, often what happens is I, uh, I'll get on a radio show that's, that has kind of a fundamentalist bent, and uh, basically they just want to argue with me. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that well, can that, be frustrating well, just, for all, all parties. <laughs> that's why we have John here. For the record, I, I would like to argue with you too, but respectfully. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, obviously... You know, as I've said, there are those who hold there are variants, and that's the kind of term that's used, I think, within textual criticism. But at the end of the day, it brings us to a conclusion on who the person is. And I, I, I obviously hold Scripture is more than adequate to bring us to a living, breathing encounter and relationship with Jesus, who claimed to be divine. So, but, but I think we so can do that in a respectful way. So you scared of this? Are you scared? No, you know what, Bart? The one question I have for you, which I, I read, uh, you know, uh, just a criticism was, uh, you know— 
is along the fact that what you don't do in your books as a teacher is actually bring out what the other counter arguments are. You, you kind of tend to not do that in your books. You you, you just quickly you mean, write off to the Christian apologists, for example. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but but I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, but even to say, hey, here's the three arguments. No, uh, listen, I'll tell you what I do in my books is I try to present the view that critical scholars have and to show what the evidence for it is. And the reason I don't present another view is because I don't think the view is compelling, and it's not a view that evangelical. That it's not a view that critical scholars have. Plus, the danger so, would be that you would come across, across, I think, a bit trite in the whole thing. Like it, it would be so hard for you, Bart. I can imagine to present the other side, the other point of view, without going <laughs> between well, the lines. The other problem. Is, the other problem is there is no there is no issue that I ever talk about in any of my books that has two points of view. Most of them have about 300 points of view. Yeah, so how do you, I get say, that? You know, you should use you should the other side. Well, <laughs> you know, I could write a 29-volume book about, yeah. you know, one of these issues, but I'm, I'm trying to show why critical scholars think what they do. And if people, if people have counter-arguments, they should make the counter-arguments, and then we can discuss it. Or read another book that have the counter-arguments. And, and there yeah. are several, I Sure, sure, yeah. Well, look, you're someone I enjoy having on the show because... I like being forced to think about the stuff that you write. So thank you for doing that, Bart. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Bart Ehrman on the Drew Marshall Show. Take care. I hope you have a great weekend. Happy St. Patrick's Day next week, Bart. All right. Thanks. Same to you. All right. Bye-bye. He's the author of Jesus Before the Gospels, How the Earliest Christians Remembered, Changed, and Invented Their Stories of the Savior. You okay, John? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Like, did did that hurt you? No, not at all. I, I, I just I worry for the person who will go into chapters or Barnes and Noble and pick a, a book and go, you know. And and one writer said, like Bart, uh, you know. And I want to be respectful and say this, but Bart is great at creating the chicken little experience. Like the sky is falling, and the sky is not falling. There's equally very good scholars who who are able to argue and, and bring it about. And so I, I think still. Scripture can more than adequately lead us. I grew up in Britain, so we we don't typically hold to an inerrancy. We hold to an infallibility, and I think there's more than enough uh, people like Ravi Zachers have argued incredibly on this. So, so uh, it doesn't upset me. What worries me is the person who's going to pick that up casually and then go into panic mode. There's more than enough scholarship and great. But if someone's going to pick up a book like Bart has written. They're going to be of the mindset of, there are more points of view, and I need to read the other side as well. But Bart's guys, the titles are so enticing. I mean, the the taglines are brilliant. Bart, if you're listening, your marketing team, you should give them a bonus. (laughs) I I mean, they are brilliant. And that's why they're selling. So it's provocative, but they're also written in a way where, quite honestly, someone coming from a more conservative background could pick it up by mistake and then go into panic mode, and I, I think... You know. Well, you know, but uh, here's what I'm saying, John. I'm fine with panic mode. I think, uh, spiritually, we should all be in panic mode, because that puts us in that tension. That puts us in that place of in-betweens. Safety and spiritual growth, they're polar right. opposite. It's like spiritual maturity. Well, uh, well, and I think that's why, in the Bible, you got the Psalms. They're full of doubt. They're yes. full of question, and I'm okay with that, but... I do not think that a God who is going to reveal himself to the world is going to then play hide-and-seek through things that don't lead us to him.